Hi, I'm Heidi Harriet, the host of the Animal Tales podcast, and I'd like to welcome you to our new series, Doggone Good Information. And I'd like to welcome my co-host, Tommy Fahey. Hi, Tommy. Hi, Heidi. How are you today? I'm great. I'm great. As excited as always to uh, get going on this. I, I really enjoy these, and it's it's been a lot of fun, and hopefully we'll be able to grow you know, our listenership. I want to talk about that right out of the gate, that... If you're listening to these and you enjoy these, um, please share them. Please let people know about it. Uh, I have two podcasts. This one, Dog on Good Information, talks more about dog training, animal training, the ph- the psychology behind it, the philosophy, the ideology, yes. and the expertise and real information. Is that how you describe it, Tommy? Yeah, I'd agree with that. Yeah, talking about real life uh, training. Yeah, what we see is practical, and and one of the reasons we do this is because I feel there's an open space for um, some reality behind this. Again, mine is a generational knowledge, and Tommy came to it um, by being young and being around horses and animals and then wanting to go on and learn the psychology and behavior of it. So, and the other, the other podcast is called Animal Tales, Heidi Harriet's Animal Tales. And there I tell stories about the people who love, care for, and work with animals. For example, the Iditarod race, medical research, the New York carriage horse industry. The ones that are really vilified or there's a lot of misinformation out there. And I want you to know the other side of the story. Uh, as always, I want you to make up your own mind, but there's a lack of information for you to do that. And on that note, Tommy, I sent you something this morning, the chat GPT, yes. terrifying, the oh, the artificial intelligence. Art. Yep, AI. You could pull this up like Google, you have to log in, but um, the information I got on the topic we're going to do today, and we'll delve into that in a minute, but very scary. So once again, people being able to get their information from these sources that are really just pulling from the misinformation because it's the popular narrative. So we're just trying to, to provide some more information or at least have you look a little deeper. So, um, well, I want to talk today, uh, just as we're getting started, I have two dogs. We talk a lot about Jimmy Dean, the Jack Russell, uh, Tommy's Jack Russell Terrier who, who not, not long ago got into it with a skunk. So <laughs> check out the last episode if you didn't hear about that. Um, my dog Otis is from a rescue. He's a standard poodle. He's a big boy. He's going on 70 pounds now that I've kind of brought his weight back up. Uh, he's gained some weight. Yeah, he is. He's very athletic and lithe. You know, he's fine. He's not going to be a tabletop dog real wide. He's he's very fit, very athletic. I'm really excited about what I'm going to be able to do with him um, training wise. But uh, and then I have Trooper, the, the six pound multipo. First of all, getting a big dog is really impactful. And I'm an animal trainer. I knew what I was getting into. I knew the cost. I have saved my money over the years. So it's not going to send me to the poor house. But I, I'm around so many people, I live in Pinellas County, Florida, who are falling prey to the, you must adopt these dogs, they need to have a home, and bringing these big dogs into their homes, and it's expensive, and boy, it's just impactful from like going places and doing things. I had a six-pound multipoo who had a dog door and was very happy on the patio furniture when I was gone, so... Now I go to a dog that's got issues. He's big. He's more expensive. Um, Yeah. Everything when you get a larger dog becomes more expensive from the basics of just feeding them. Yeah. More. Um, So per volume, you're feeding more uh, food. But then when you look at um, veterinary costs or boarding costs, a lot of times those are going by weight. Um, so your heart pills, medicine. <laughs> yeah, heart the, the heart room, pills uh, go by weight and they're much yeah, more expensive. So, and then the higher the weight, the more it's going to cost because there's more of the, the drug or the product in there. Yeah. So yeah, everything gets more and more expensive exponentially. And even impact wet paws. So mm-hmm. I'm in Florida. We have humidity. Oh gosh, already <clears throat> it is lovely out, but we're still getting humid mornings. So I, go, they run the dogs. Well, trooper, I clip their feet off, even though uh, the breed would probably keep longer hair. 
because I don't want him tracking everything in. But sure. Otis's wet paws are ex- exponentially more impactful than my six pound, my 68 pound versus my six pound. So even yes. that, you know, and again, I knew all this. This is no surprise. I grew up with all types of animals, including a lot of dogs, standard poodles. But I see these people at the park with their dogs and God bless them at some level. Um, but I just want to say that to people shout out. If you're looking to get a dog, it feels good on the front side, but just know there's a big impact. And yeah. And then I want to go into the training of Otis. So Otis is very timid and he starts to come around in the morning by evening. He's back to slinking and being a nervous wreck. So I'm going to, I'm going to do a little bit more training, but, um, as the day goes on as well. And I take him for walks, but I train with the AKC good citizen program. I love it. The canine good citizen program. There are tutorials online. It's wonderful. It's, um, what they've designed to help homeowners associations, apartment complexes say, yes, we'll accept your dog, but they must be uh, CGC canine good citizens. And it's a certification you get. Love the program. I'm an evaluator, but I'm an evaluator because I love the program, not the other way around. Sure. Um, And what it is real quickly, it's accepting a friendly stranger. So your dog has to be respectful and not jump on you, not growl at you, not run away. Sitting politely, uh, they must be kept well, appearance and grooming, right? They can't be a mess. They can't be smelly and all that. And that's, of course, in their best interest as well. They must walk on a a loose leash so you can't be like holding on to them for dear life. They got to walk through a crowd. They got to sit and do a down on command and stay in place. They have to come when called. They have to not react to another dog and they have to not react to distraction. So if a motor goes by a car or something, all of this is stuff I'm going through with Otis and then supervised separation. The last part of it, you, I have to walk up to you, hand you my leash and my dog and say, thank you, Tommy. And you can say to the dog, you're going with Tommy, whatever makes you feel good. And you have to be able to walk off with the dog very comfortably. Okay. And I love this because these are all things individually that I grew up with and are really important to me. So AKC right. has put it into a program. They have tutorials and stuff online. So it's great. And if you, Training is about timing. So even though the tutorial's there, if you don't understand the timing of it, get professional help. And that's what I do a lot of. My husband gets mad at me because I go in and say, this is what you need to do and help them with over the hump of some things. And then they go on without me instead of me saying, you're going to need me for 30 visits and da, 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 da. <laughs> um, yes. And, but I stay in touch with them. And a lot of times they bring me back to help tweak something, but I'm just very matter of fact. So don't want to take up a lot of time, but just it's AKC canine good citizen. And they have a star S T A R it's an acronym star puppy program. Again, great information, very layman's terms and very, very practical. So Hopefully that'll help you folks thinking about your dogs and training. And um, I saw something online today and I'll, I'll end my part of this. A guy who uh, apparently didn't know how to train dogs and now he's become a very good dog trainer. I follow him online. I love what he says. It's, it resonates with me. He's my tribe. (laughs) He said today, people think dog training is hard. What's hard is, the consequences of not training your dogs. Very good point. I thought that was very succinct, which I'm not usually succinct as we know. So (laughs) I thought that was great. And then he went on to elaborate, but. Yeah, there was a post on Facebook I saw the other day and it was more geared towards horsemanship and training horses. Same thing, by the way. Uh, But it's, yeah, animal training. All this applies exactly the same for me to dogs and horses. Yeah, and and really it was about learning sort of any any new thing. And so training and riding horses is all about learning technique, timing, and then feel. Yeah. And so I can tell you a dozen techniques. I can give you a dozen exercises to do with your dog or your horse or your child. But if you don't understand the timing of it, and then you don't have a feel for what you're doing, it's probably not going to go very well. 
That's exactly right. Yeah, you, you really can't just learn this by reading a book about it. You have to work with somebody who's done it, who has a feel for it, and who can help explain to you and, and help you uh, with your timing of it. Right. And as you know, sometimes we can, a lot of my clients, I can say right there, that's when you need to reward that, or that's when you need to get that, ah, no, quit, whatever, yeah. eh, you know, those moments. And when, the, for a lot of those people, the light bulb goes off and it works and that gets them over the hump. So absolutely, you have to have that. Um, you have to be able to feel that. And that's yeah. what's missing in a lot of programs. Frankly, I think that's what target training is all about. And I'm not an yeah. expert on target training, but I think the reason it works for people is it's so detailed. It's so um, on the spot that you have to catch the timing. That's all, because target training is really just a timing thing. You yeah. don't even need the clicker. You could say, or not target, clicker training. I'm sorry. I meant to say clicker training. You could click or say yes. It's the timing of it that's making Correct. it work. So, yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> By the way, that's I'll a whole new you. thing. That's a whole new thing I'm hearing. Yes. Like that. And I, I really don't like it. It's like they're telling people to do that. Instead of good or, I don't know, just it's real quick and... Well, again, it's about the feel. Yeah. And if you are amping up your energy with a, a yes, yeah, so you're taking the dog from a five to a 10 yeah, rather than maybe just a six or a seven. Yep. Yeah. So, so. Again, it's, it's about staying in that middle ground and not interrupting what it is that you're trying to accomplish. Right. Great information. And Tommy and I have talked a lot about how we make sure we stay on track, but in part, so much of the information we're just dying to get out there to see what you think about it, um, putting it into practice. And again, let us hear from you. What's been working for you? What isn't working? Those types of things. What you'd like to hear us talk about? Critique us. We, we could take it. We've got broad yeah. shoulders. Well, <laughs> and you know, let us know what you like. But we really, you know, we're putting our time into this. We don't get paid to do this, and. Just very important information we want to get out there. Exactly, yeah. Yeah, and I'm Heidi Harrod. This is Tommy Fahey, and we're doing a podcast, Dog on Good Information. We're just entering into our main topic. So, Tommy, I'm going to introduce it this way. Tommy, um, I went out last night with some friends, and we socialized. Okay. And it was so much fun, right? We hung yes. out together. So... Our main topic today is socialization of dogs. I really dislike this word, and I, as we were preparing for this segment, I thought about why I dislike it, because that's the what comes to my mind when I hear socialization. It means Correct. me getting out and hanging out with either you and I or a group of friends or even going to the Gasparilla and just being around a lot of people. It's almost the opposite for dogs at some level, so... I'll let you take it from there. Yeah, we've, we've talked about this on a previous episode of definitions of words and definitions being changed over time. And so you have connotation and denotation. Um, and I think this is a perfect example of that, is that the idea of what we're trying to get across by saying you need to socialize your pet is not that you need to take them out to a social event and turn them loose. <laughs> happy hour. That's, yeah. We, we don't take them to the happy hour. Um, and we don't, we don't drop them in the middle of uh, a very, you know, public space or a very busy street or, right. you know, that's, that's not the concept. Um, and I, that's where things are, are really getting missed. That's kind of the so, conclusion. That's the test of your training program. When you feel like, I got this, this dog is with me, he's paying attention, let's go out and check out the farmer's market or the big event and see, Correct. and be on the fringe of it at the end, yeah. Yeah, so when we talk about socialization for your dog, really what you're doing is preparing that dog to in a controlled environment to go into public spaces or more chaotic events. Right. We're not just dropping them in willy-nilly. Um, so I think of two examples of, of this that kind of came to mind. And one is the jungle book. So Mowgli, the little boy that was raised in the jungle. Yeah. 
You could not take Mowgli and turn him loose on the Las Vegas Strip and go, good luck. He's not going to know how to socialize or interact with all the people. It's going to be overwhelming for him. He's going to be terrified. He's not going to know how to navigate. He's not going to know how to communicate. Um, So it's just going to be an absolute catastrophe for him. Yeah. The other example is uh, the movie Nell. Did you ever watch that? I don't think so. Back in the 90s. So it's a movie about um, a young girl who is raised in a very rural cabin uh, by her mother. She has a twin sister and the mother dies when the girls are very young and then the twin sister dies. So she basically raises herself in the middle of the woods with no human interaction. And her only language is that twin language that she developed with her sister. Oh, interesting. So she does these sort of rambling um, verbalizations and then she's finally discovered by a local doctor um, and he wants to very slowly acclimate her into society. And then another uh, character in the movie is wanting to take her basically to a laboratory and study her. Mm. Um, But the point of it is um, you could not take this unsocialized person who has no communication skills, who doesn't know anything about the world. You can't just pick her up and drop her into the middle of the city and hope for the best. Yeah. That's not what we're talking about when we say socialization. Um, You need to slowly and methodically develop your communication with your animal uh, so this is focus and communication, which is all what training is. So it's we talk foundation, about foundation training. Foundation. Yeah. <clears throat> so before you just run out in public and take your new dog, whether it's a puppy or a, a dog that you've adopted, an older right. uh, animal, you have to get some sort of communication going at home in a controlled environment. Yep. And I think that's what is missing for a lot of people is they hear, I need to socialize my pet. And so they go, okay, I'm going to go to the Home Depot or right. I'm going to take it to the dog park or whatever. We need a play date. Scenario. I see it online all the time. I need to yeah, socialize no, my dog. You don't. Who's doing, who's, you know, who's out? Can we do walks? Can we do play dates? Whatever. Yeah. Um, so uh, we, we made a little chart and that will go up on, uh, on social media and then uh, we'll probably put it in the background here. Yeah. Uh, Tommy's the so, chart maker. He's very good at it. <laughs> I do like a chart. Um, and I'm, I may have found a picture of a Jack Russell to put on it. So there is that. <laughs> Did Jimmy Dean biased. pose for your chart? Oh my. <laughs> no, that wasn't Jimmy Dean, but it's pretty close. Okay. Uh, so what is dog socializ- socialization and what do we mean by that? So it's the methodical exposure to sights, smells, noises, um, general handling, like cooperative care is another term that we use. Um, exposure to a collar or a harness, and then exposure to restraint. Um, Things like what your vet is going to need to do to do uh, vaccinations, to do nail trims, to do, you know, sometimes exams. Um, So all of that is something that you can start doing with a either a young puppy or even an older dog. You slowly and methodically develop that at home in a controlled environment. You're developing focus and communication with your dog by methodical training. And then because you develop that focus and communication, you're able to build positive associations with things that could otherwise be quite overwhelming. So you can positively associate things like fireworks, right? Like loud noises, like the mailman, um, cars, dogs, cars, um, any of those things. But you can't do that if you don't have a baseline of communication, focus, and then trust with your animal. And that always goes back to the two things we preach on this sh- this program that, again, I'm open to hear what other people have to say about things, but my non-negotiables, non-negotiables for me are foundation training. It's my responsibility because that's the best thing I could do for the animals in my care and the most loving thing I could do that if something happens to me, they're going to be fine. People are going to love having them. They're well-behaved. Think well-behaved children being, you know, so, and the other is best practices, animal husbandry and not 
just throwing away what we what we know, the scientific evidence, the data, and the generational knowledge combined with all those updates. That is what animal husbandry is to me, and that's what best practices are. So we start with a solid foundation, and part of that foundation is always give me your eyes, give me your mm-hmm. eyes, give me your eyes. Anytime they're nervous, and this is small stuff, this is somebody closing a door in your house, this is turning on the water faucet, this is the ice machine. I'm going through all this with Otis right now. <laughs> um, give me your eyes. Look, Hey, nothing to see here, Get, look at me. Yeah. Um, again, if you have children, think about when your kids were little and how you helped them through things. You didn't say, oh, it's all, I'm so sorry. It's, it's really not going to scare you. And maybe you did. Chances are your children are puddles. But uh, we're saying, hey, you're fine here. And we're moving past all those. So we're making those things uh, either a neutral or even a good. The ice machine, I know a lot of dogs, and I've had uh, dogs who sat by the ice machine, like drop one of those babies for me, you know? Uh So you can go from, oh my God, the ice machine to, hey, can somebody turn that thing on for me? You know, that's that's the how you want to be thinking. So this is all the real little stuff, but this is the stuff you're doing in your home. And I want to throw in here that, we see it all the time, and I've mentioned it on the podcast before. COVID set me back on socializing my dog. My poor dog is a COVID dog. I hear it all the time. Yeah. Frankly, there was no better time to train your dog than COVID. You had time with them. You had you were kind of closed in together, right? So those yeah. interactions where you say, you and me, you and me, you and me, look at my eyes, right? You want them to be thoughtful. You want them to look at you if they're nervous and give look for you for the guide, take them on long walks, get them more comfortable. I'm in very uh, low distraction areas with Otis right now because as soon as I get out near a road that's busy, He gets really nervous and I lose his attention. So I say to myself, nope, my husband and I walk. Nope, got to go back to the quieter area. He's not here yet. We're not here yet. We're not even remotely ready to turn him loose with other dogs, this, you know, socialization, because he doesn't look at me yet for everything. So that's your, when I tell clients this, sometimes that little bit, the light bulb goes off. Do they look at you when they're confused or when they need to know what to do? Do they give you their eyes? If they're not, you're not even close to taking them to the farmer's market because now you've got them pulled out to talk to this dog over here and you're visiting. And when you say, hey, let's go, they don't turn around and look at you and say, yes, okay, what would you, you know. So that's how you know you're not in that mode. This is an anthropomorphic word to me. Very much so. Uh, Socializing. I think this is for animals saying socializing is I don't like the word. And I didn't grow up with this word. We, I never heard this word. I'm a third generation trainer. Never talked about socializing. It's, um, I feel like it's in the last five years. I, maybe I'm wrong, but it's a new yeah, word. I think it's a newer concept or a newer um, side of, of things coming out. Yeah. Um, and I think you're right. It is this anthropomorphizing uh, sort of concept. Um, there is some science behind this, and, and I think we should probably talk about that. Um, so, it, w- especially from a puppy, okay? So, there is a window of opportunity in a puppy's development. So, as their brain is developing, as they're, uh, you know, just maturing. So, from about three weeks to about 14 weeks, uh, you have a prime window for them to experience new things and create positive associations with those things. Um, so they, they learn about the world. Yeah. Okay? So, so if you pull back out of our, our modern society and you think just totally natural environment, think wolf cubs in a den, they start venturing out at about three weeks. They start exploring the world, experiencing things. They see, you know, trees and they see bushes and they start to, see uh rabbits or squirrels or birds overhead yeah yeah so they start to experience the world and so between that three and 14 week period is when they are most uh here's our big word for the day neuroplasticity Uh so that's your brain's ability to form new connections okay 
Um, so you start to lose neuroplasticity and this happens in humans, um, as you age. Okay. So well, that explains a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Not to call you out. Yeah. Um, but if you think about it in human terms, um, you know, you are very neuroplastic. And if you sp- think specifically about language, it's very easy to learn a new language or multiple languages at a very young age. Yes from like two to six is if they're exposed to multiple languages, if a child is exposed to multiple languages, it's going to be very easy for them to pick that up and, and be able to use it the rest of their life. I growing up in the circus, that's a perfect example because these little stinkers could speak five languages and and communicate with a group of people in all different, unbelievable when you're little. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. But after that window closes, it's not impossible for you to learn a new language. Heidi, you or I could go out and learn Spanish tomorrow. If we put the work in and and put time into it, it would take us longer. It would probably take more work on our parts um, because we don't have the same uh, neuroplasticity in our brain uh, because we are more mature. Uh, So the same thing goes with a puppy uh, or a kitten Um, and really this goes kind of across all species is that you have a window where things are easier to, to get this socialization, get these positive associations going. That doesn't mean you can't do it later. Now. So you use the wolf, the wolf cub, you know, so let's take it to, uh, suburbia to USA with, uh, Mm -hmm. uh, mankind, right? We have these dogs in our homes. So, I believe our role in during these times when, and I'm again, Otis is a great example. He's three years old, but he literally looks up like, what is that? What is that? A bird goes overhead, a tree mm-hmm. rustles, right? My job yeah. is to say, it's fine. That's a tree. Right. I don't go, it's okay. It's okay. It's okay. Cause he's already nervous. So that's where I think our job in this socialization process, this word I don't care for, but um, is to, to, help them understand it's okay and cement their training and relationship with you, uh, make that progress before we introduce them to one-on-one to other species and groups of species where they, we expect them to handle it on their own. So that's our role is to let them know this is okay and have fun with it, not be nervous about it. Yeah. There's another word uh, that's incorporated into this idea and it's desensitizing Yes, or desensitization. Yeah. Um, and I think, again, that's a bit of a misnomer. Agreed. Uh, the, the wrong definition behind it. We talk a lot about it. You hear a lot about it in horses. Horses. Absolutely. Um, and a lot of horses thing, who've been sacked out with Walmart bags, boy. Yes. I never and used a Walmart bag in my life, but my horses were What's misunderstood like, oh. about that. Um, it is the idea of that bag on a stick that you shake at them. And if you shake it at them long enough, they're going to get over it and they're never going to be scared of a plastic bag again in their life. That is not how that works. No. What you do need to do is expose the animal to a stimulus they don't care for. Yeah. Prior to doing that, you need to have developed their focus and developed a level of communication So that when they are scared, they look to you and say, are we scared? Yeah. And then your reaction to whatever that environment is, is to say, we're not scared. Everything is fine. Nothing to see here. We're fine. So I do this with horses quite often is that I will first, I develop that focus and communication skill. Foundation training. Very Yep. We do that in a very quiet, controlled environment. Yes. Uh, I love a nice round pen away from the hustle and bustle. If, it, if I'm working with a dog, I'm usually doing it in my house, in my living room, exactly. quiet, controlled environment, not a lot going on. And we learn basic commands. We learn sit, stay, uh, get on a mark. We learn uh, to walk on a leash. Kennel up. Inside. Yeah. We don't go out for a walk when they don't know what a leash is inside. Yeah. Yeah. I so walk around the backyard. Yeah. Yeah, we start around that those basic things in a very controlled environment. And it's, so maybe a different word for social socialization is education. Yeah. We are educating the animal about these specific training things that we're going to use throughout the rest of their life. Exactly. Um, 
And again, so that desensitization idea is really more about, again, going back to that, developing that focus and communication, the training, basic foundation training, so that when something scary happens, when a new uh, stimulus presents itself, the animal looks to you to know how to react. And your reaction is what tells them how they should react. Exactly so right. This is very similar to raising kids and w- what you brought up earlier. You know, if you fall and skin your knee and your mom goes, Oh my God, are you okay? You poor baby, you poor thing, you must hurt so bad. In your brain, you're solidifying, I hurt really bad and this is very scary. And mom is crying, so I should be crying. Yeah. My mom was not like that at all. No, my, my mom's retired army. She's been a nurse. <laughs> she was a nurse practitioner. So we would fall and scrape her knee and she'd be like, you'll live. Yeah. Get up. Keep going. You yeah. know? And of course, she'd take care of it and clean it off and put a bandaid on it or whatever it was. But it was just, again, very matter of fact. This is not a big deal. And we're moving on with our day. Well, I could tell you as a parent and an animal trainer, the other reason we do that, because I was the same with my kids, I'm a disciplinarian, and I was terribly concerned that they were hurt at times, and same with my animals, but it's my job to keep the situation under control as a leader, yeah. right? Whether you a parent or a leader, it's the same thing, and I have to be the one to say, hey, you're fine, let's see, let's take a look, oh, you're fine, mm-hmm. and that's the best thing you can do. So now let's talk about how do you know when it like you've you've done your work at home, somebody's listening to us telling this, you know, uh, providing this information and they say, OK, I'm going to back up. I'm going to stop going to the farmer's market. I'm going to work with my dog. The test is in your own controlled environment, your dog is always looking to you and you call them and say, hey, come here or go over there. If it's a puppy, these are going to be not quite as consistent, but you're still mm-hmm. working on them but that they're looking at you, they're thoughtful, they don't lose their shit and like go crazy. If the garbage truck comes up and you're in your house, in your environment, and that dog goes crazy and you can't control it, you're not gonna have any hope of controlling it the minute you walk out that door and even just one neighbor dog goes by. Mm -hmm. So your test is, do you have, people are gonna pick on the word control, but I'm, I'm sorry, I'm old school. You, do you have, do they listen to you? Are they checked in to you? It's a mental influence connection, influence, fine. That's the test. That's when I know I'm ready for the next thing. So when that dog looks at you above everything else, because that needs to happen in a crowded space or the busy or chaotic space or the dangerous space, Tommy and I both work with horses, Damn horses figure out how to get into everything. Mine got in the, <laughs> she kicked her feet through a round pen panel. Uh-huh. Talk about your animal needing to look at you and keep their shit together. Oh, yeah. you're fine. Whoa. Yeah. You know? Well, they Do saw and they have to use a saw. So there's uh-huh. noise. So same thing with dogs. They get themselves in trouble. We got to figure it out. So that's the test. If they're looking to you for leadership, in those environments, you have a hope. And then test slowly. Don't load up and go to the farmer's market or go to the concert on the green where there are going to be hundreds of people. Yeah. Take a walk down your street, pass one other dog, role play it. And Training is role is. playing. Have your neighbor come out with their dog. Joe, can you get your dog out? I want you to walk down the street. Don't let your dog just walk past me. Be matter of fact, right? Whatever it is, Joe, knock on the door for me so I can make sure my, you know. So when you talk about play date, which is, we hear that so often, instead of thinking play date, think training opportunity. Training opportunity. Bring your dog over. Let's see how this goes. Yeah. Set it up in a controlled manner where you can, you know, influence the environment and back things off if you need to, or you can allow it to continue and go more forward. Yep. Uh, yeah. So Caesar Milan said Caesar Milan said something. The dog whisperer said something interesting uh, recently, which was not only do I want to be able to control their behaviors, right? And he he the man has some cojones. He deals with aggressive dogs, which I mm-hmm. really don't do. Uh, but he said I even let them know when it's time to play. Yeah. In in our society, we're almost doing the opposite. We're asking the dogs if they're done playing so that we could go back to our routines. All right. 
Well, and that's, that's a point is if you think of this socialization as taking your dog to a dog park and turn it loose, and then you're trying to recall your dog or get control of the situation, but you have no foundation. You can't recall them at home. Right. But now you're in a chaos environment. You are now reinforcing the idea to that animal that they don't need to listen to you. Yeah. That you don't have any influence or control over them and that they are in a free for all and that's okay. Yeah. So yep. you re- you really need to back off and get yourself into that controlled environment and get influence, you know, 80 to 90% of the time. It's not going to be perfect all the time. Yeah. But, but you got to be the one they start to get, uh, you know, consistency, then you can start to expand. And if you want to know how to get your dog off leash and come to you, feel free to reach out to me. I'm very good at that. So yeah, have some, <laughs> not that there's any secret sauce, but I do have some tips and tricks for that. So that is something I struggle with, uh, with Jimmy Dean and because of, I think it's mostly because of his breed, the terrier. Oh yeah. They're, they're very strong minded. Yep. Um, and yeah. if he flips the switch to go after a squirrel, he's in fight and flight mode. And it's very hard to get his attention and bring him back to me. That's exactly right. And a lot of people are getting breeds. We're not getting just the family friendly breeds. People buy these hunting dogs and bulldogs and different things that had jobs and were conditioned to do something. So it, it makes our training even harder. When I was young, that wasn't the case. There were these family dogs, you know? Yeah. So this is great information. We could, we could go on and on, but I think we've left with some really good information. And again, let us know what you think about this, but it, Tommy's graph puts it very succinctly, but at the end of the day, work on your own one in one and then test yourself with small increments. That's how you'll know you're getting to the point where then you might be able to go into a larger scenario. But yeah. as you're doing that, Tommy says this, uh, has said this on the podcast many times. I just want to leave you with, are you taking your dog in those scenarios because you want, because the dog wants to go or because you want them to go? I don't take my dogs many places at all. I enjoy them at home. Love uh, my dogs. Exactly. So really consider your motivation for showing off What's your rationale for taking your mm-hmm. dog all these places? But don't circumvent yeah. the training program. Keep it going. Correct. Keep that foundation. And you got to, like anything else, you got to keep working with it. You don't do it once and it's done. Keep, yeah. keep testing so, it. A final thought on, on this social, socialization yes. thing, um, especially if you have a puppy. Uh, we talked about the, the socialization window, which is three to 14 weeks. Um, puppies, they're not considered fully vaccinated after they, until after they've had their series of puppy vaccines. Yeah. This is a big one. Yeah. Yeah. And that usually isn't complete until 16 weeks. Um, and that's when they get their final, uh, distemper parvo combination and then also a rabies shot. So again, it goes back to best practices and animal husbandry. Don't expose your dog. You wouldn't take uh, an unvaccinated child into a daycare center and turn them loose because um, they're going to get sick. So be very careful with that and consult your veterinarian on what is acceptable at their stage of vaccination. Yeah. But there are still plenty of opportunities to let them experience things, you know, open yes. spaces and such where you can take them and not, not put them at risk or others at risk. So correct. Yeah. Good, good point, Tommy. Thank you for that. All right. That was excellent. And uh, there'll be more information online. We always follow it up with show notes and provide some links for you. So check that out as well. All right, Tommy, we are into our pet peeve. (laughs) You have the pet peeve peeve this week. Yes. My pet peeve this week is the retractable leash. Oh, (laughs) yeah. Uh, these are such a nice idea in theory, but in practice really are horrible. Um, and, and it really, and again, it goes back to, it's not the tool, it's how you use it. Yeah. Um, and the problem is that most people, when they're using a retractable leash, just let the dog go nuts. Yeah. They just let it go to the end of the leash and pull and pull and pull. And then the dog is running wild and wrapping itself up around you or other people or around trees or whatever it is. Um, And again, it goes back to that idea of the foundation training. You need a smaller, 
environment, controlled space so that you can get their attention. You can develop their focus, which will help you develop communication, which is the foundation of training. So a retractable leash is really giving too much leeway right off the bat. Yep. Um, so maybe for a really well-trained dog, yeah, a retractable leash can be an acceptable uh, piece of equipment. But especially for a, a puppy, an untrained dog, um, a dog with issues, training issues, um, you know, a- anxiety or aggression issues, you need a short, solid leash that you can get a hold of them and help them figure out their environment. Absolutely. So my pet peeve is retractable leashes. And even with a well-behaved dog, the way to use a retractable leash, the design for them, was not to walk your dog with them. It's when you're walking, that's why there's a piece this long and then the long cord. You're mm-hmm. supposed to walk them on the short leash. It's designed for people who are in especially urban areas where then you can stop and you can't turn your dog loose because it's illegal in most places. You can Correct. let the leash out to go potty. That exactly. being said, and this is um, a little training piece, but on a one hour walk, I don't allow sniffs more than two times. If your dog is sniffing all the way, you're not having a productive walk. There's no training involved and you're not in control. So Mm -hmm. I walk, I let him go potty before I go. And then they actually learn they have to think about it. And then I go off, I'll go for 20 minutes and I don't provide any sniff and I walk off and they have to come along with me. It's not like, come on, Fluffy, come on. I'm like, let's go, Otis, you know? So that's what the leash is for, to to go potty when it's time. That's it. You have to think of the walk as a job. Yeah. They, yep. they need to be focused on you and considering that their work time. And what that will do for them is actually mentally wear them out so that when you get home, they'll relax. Oh, my gosh. You just took my training tip. Oh, sorry. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> it's a perfect lead in. Um, minds think alike. Yeah, we, that usually happens. I want to back up quickly. We're going to talk about mentally and physically training. But last night I went to an event with a group of people. My husband's in a running group. And one of the gals, they all had their shorts on. They're all in great shape. She turned around and showed everybody across the back of her legs. So here and then here, like really bad gashes. Oh, no. Retractable leash. It's not the Mm. first time I've seen it. And they were angry looking deep. Rope burn. Oh, that's so, the bigger the dog, the more dangerous. I'm, I, Uh that getting coiled in a leash terrifies me. And I don't even use that cord. Yeah. Um, so it truly is dangerous. And if you look online, you'll see that there's studies about that, where how dangerous those, those leashes are. So yeah, yeah it's fun. That's why tool. I kind of made a noise when you said retractable <laughs> leash, because I was thinking about her this morning. So my training tip, I got a call. We're going to combine this now with like our viewer mailbag or listener mailbag. Yeah. Please submit your questions. Yeah. You questions we're, about training. Or, let's answer or those questions. So one I got this week, and it's funny because it paralleled with a client that I went to see this week, a, a new cl- new mm. client, Chocolate mm. Lab. It's a puppy. It's uh, five months old. It's 35 pounds, and it oh, knows wow. how to use its weight. It's adorable. <laughs> um, High but, energy. Usually. Yeah, and a fairly small apartment, you know, or house type scenario, and has to be on a leash, no open backyard. So yeah. first thing I always say, the puppy was molested me when I walked in the door and it's big and it has no control and it's got giant uh-huh. paws. And, you know, I'm like, no, nope, down. You know, I start right away as I walk mm-hmm. in the door. So I sat and talked with the lady and the puppy was just bouncing off the walls. And we didn't go outside, but I put a leash and a collar on her dog and I walked back and forth, back and forth through the living room. And I just walk off. Come on, let's go. Yep. I don't look for their pace. I set the pace. You're coming along with me. And I did that while I was talking to her and explaining training and why she absolutely has to get a foundation on this dog and went back and forth probably about 15 times. And this is very short, like a living room, right? Just up, back, up, back. And first the dog's kind of all over and then he's coming around like a little soldier, just adorable, Uh you know? And um, then I stopped 
and I made him sit. He doesn't really know how, but I had him do a little sit. Got up again, did my walk again. And I'm talking to her the whole time, but my, my energy is still staying with the dog. So you can do that. It's a training exercise until I tell you it's not. So mm. even when I stop and say something to the lady, my focus is with the dog. So then I, I was only there. I was at the house an hour. So this was about 30 minutes of that time. And then I sat the last 10 minutes. The puppy came over. First of all, it came to me, even though I'm the one that kind of started dragging it a little. Like, come on, let's go. I don't drag it, but like tug and release. Come on, let's go. Move along, yeah. move along. And they start trotting along. And it liked it. It was look at boy, it was giving me its eyes all day long. And I kept I was trying to explain all this to her as I was doing it. And then I go sit down and the puppy came and sprawled out next to me and was the most contented puppy you've ever seen. Mm -hmm. And that is physical and mental. That's when you've been stimulated physically and mentally and you're tired. Yes. And I Correct. can't tell you how many clients, and I no doubt you go through the same thing, and this is true with horses as well. When I leave and I say, you're going to you're, you're gonna see your horse differently, your dog differently. Mm -hmm. And I get calls say, there's something wrong with my dog. No, your dog is spent, but I, I had brain power going on here. Mm -hmm. And that's when you, that's where that anxiety stuff gets, gets uh, taken apart. Because their brain gets used. I filled up their brain and now they're exhausted. Yeah. And she was like, I have never seen my puppy like this. So if your dog is still hyped up after you've gone for your walk, you're not working their brain enough. Get in their brain. Make them stop and sit. Make Do a figure eight. Do, don't just walk straight ahead and talk yeah. to them the whole time. Stay in their mind. Hey, look at me. Give me your eyes. That's, I do it 20 times on a 40-minute on a walk. Well, yeah. 10 times, right? About every five habit. minutes, give me your eyes. I make a habit because I live in a neighborhood also. And when I walk, anytime I'm going to cross the road, whether it's at an intersection or anything, yes, they have to sit, yep. look at me, and then we go on, on my cue. Uh, I do the same thing. just rush into the road. Yep. And then there's, there's a particular uh, larger, busier road um, and we get there and I make Jimmy Dean sit, stay. And then I pick him up and carry him across the road. Yeah. And now he knows we'll get probably 30, 40 feet from the intersection. And he starts slowing down. Yeah. He starts pulling back and, and going, I'm not, I'm not supposed to get near that road. And he'll stop That's and great. sit on his own. Yeah. And I did that thinking that if he ever did get loose and I couldn't recall him, he might slow down and sit before he crossed that road. That's right. Yep. I do that with Otis. Every single intersection, there's yellow. We're in a neighborhood, yeah. so there's yellow with bumps. I'm um, almost, for, uh, I'd like to get more involved to have him feel those bumps, but at the very least, we do a, I do a, I stop and I'm doing it verbal and nonverbal. I do, mm -hmm. I do both ways, but I go fast, you go fast. I do my old lady walk because one day I'll be there and I want to lean on him <laughs> and I walk real slow and I expect him to slow way down and start walking right in Stay step right with, with me. You. And then yeah. I stop and then I'll jog off. Whatever I do, mm -hmm. you got to do. It's like follow the leader, mm -hmm. but it keeps their brain working. It's, it's the mental activity. If you <laughs> haven't experienced this, I tell you what, it's, it will change your life and you will love it because you will see a different side of your animal and it creates that connection we're talking about. Yes. Yeah. I would use it also uh, when I worked at the vet clinic. Oh, sure. And we have high energy dogs come in and the owner has no communication with the dog and the dog is just, you know, kind of bouncing off the walls. And it's a tiny exam room. Yeah. Um, and I would say, you know, let, I think your dog needs to go to the bathroom. Let me take it outside for you real quick. <laughs> and we would just go for a walk around the building five minutes. And in five minutes, that dog was focused on me yeah. and relaxed, would pay attention. I could get done what I needed to get done with the exam or with, uh, you know, whatever it was that we were doing. It just made the whole thing go a lot better. Yeah. Um, it's, it's amazing yeah, how quickly it can happen. It's the reinforcement of that. I tell people all the time, the training, the, the behavior can change. I mm -hmm. can stop a dog from barking now, but yeah. you have to reinforce that if they're not staying with me. That's and where the I work think, comes in. I think the big takeaway from that also is that, when you do that, 
they become so much more settled uh, and content. It's a, it's, it's what you and I talk about this. We know our end game when we start yes. and I'm just seeking that is a non-negotiable. I have to get there with every animal and there, I've never had an animal. I couldn't get there. I don't make any excuses. I don't want their backstory. We're creating a new story. That's mm-hmm. a whole nother podcast, but you're allowing them to feed on their fear or neuroses or anxiety. Uh-uh, yeah. change that up, get in their brain, yeah. tell them a new story, start a new story. And uh, the you, the rewards are just fantastic. And you've secured that dog's well-being for life. That's exactly. the most important part of that, whoever they live with. So... This has been great. Great episode. And again, let us hear from you. We want to we want to answer your questions. Let us know what you don't like. Uh, let us know what you want to hear. So, Tommy, yeah. as always, All thank you. criticism. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Present it well and we'll take it fine. Um, Tommy, thank you so much as always. Thank you, Heidi. It's been a pleasure. And thank you for listening in. And I hope you'll join us next time for more doggone good information. <laughs>